Welcome everyone. We're so excited uh, on today. We have a, spe a very special guest with us, Troy Johnson. Hello everyone. With the African American Literature Book Club. And we're just so excited that you're here uh, with us on Doc Live. So everyone, please subscribe, please share, uh, gather everyone for a wonderful conversation that we're about to have on today. And shout out to our studio audience. Hey. hey. <laughs> and so thank you, Danya, for um, the technical support. And so everyone, everyone, please gather um, so we can get started with our conversation. Sure. I am, you know, this is a beloved friend, Troy Johnson. He's so encouraging. And we just want to just appreciate you and thank you so much for your encouragement. Thank you. Over the years, you have encouraged us and we just appreciate you. Yeah, what you do is so important. I mean, I tell anybody and everybody that uh, stores like the dock are really unique in the sense that you have a large space uh, full of conscious material, clearly supportive of the community, supportive of our people, and I can't help but support that. I mean, your mis our missions are similar, um, but to run a physical bookstore day in, day out is it, takes a tremendous amount of dedication, energy, and obviously some business savvy to keep it uh, going for as long as you have. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. This truly is a labor of love. <laughs> yes, yes. We actually are celebrating 15 years. So we um, in May was um, our 15th anniversary. And so, yeah, we're thankful. We're thankful to our community and to our friends. And so and to our partners, we have a lot of partners as well. So I hear your accent. So kind of where are you from? Where, where is the accent, accent from? Yes, you do. Right, you so. have that um, East Coast accent. Sure. All right. So, so and y'all excuse us because we're enjoying our wine as well. Cheers. <laughs> cheers. Yeah, I'm, I'm from uh, East Harlem in New York City. Um, born and raised. Um, lived through, you know, in fact, they're celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop. You know, so I was there when hip hop emerged. Okay. And in fact, I still have my cassette tapes of uh, Shaw Rock and Flash and all of these people. Wow. And, um, so, yeah, witnessing that and going to Harlem World and Mr. Souls, and, and I've gone to the Disco Fever once in the Bronx. Uh, but just um, seeing that emerge has been, you know, incredible. And, you know, Harlem is, um, when I grew up, it was one of the places that it was a tough place to live. And, um, but it was, uh, a great place uh, for a number of reasons. One of those mentioning the, watching the birth of hip hop. Oh yeah, it was a lot of culture. A lot, a lot, a lot of culture, but there was a lot missing as well. You mm -hmm. know, we uh, I was speaking at a panel at Tulsa yesterday, and I was describing how I was not familiar with the Harlem Renaissance. You know, it just simply wasn't taught. <laughs> really? It just simply wasn't taught to me. And not only did I was I unaware of the Harlem Renaissance. Now that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, we, um, you so know. So when did you learn about the Harlem Renaissance as in an, Harlem? As an adult. I mean. Wow. And, and that, that says a lot to the education system. Yeah, so. It, all right, so. Okay, yeah. and, and that's the problem. So I was, uh, I was, you know, I, was, I got some, I got one of the better educations that you could get in the public school systems in New York City at mm. the time. So when I was coming up. Oh, you PS, PS1. I was PS101. <laughs> okay. I, literally, and so and, and PS one hundred and one, what they did, and I don't think it's a good idea in hindsight, but they would track kids, and so if you you know if you was in class one one, you was in the smartest class. If you was in class one two, you was in second smartest class, all the way down the line. Okay. So if you're in class one eight, you know what does that do to your psyche? Because everybody knows, you know. Everybody in one one with their the brainiacs, three the ones that got teased, and everybody in one eight were like, you know, you got we used to say retarded back then, but oh, yeah. the, you guys were, you know, just dumb. The special class. Yeah, special. You were, mm -hmm. And you know, the cool kids were in the middle somewhere like that. But um, no, and so when you track kids like that, you kind of reinforce um, the idea that okay, these kids are smart, and you're, and these kids are dumb, and and it plays out into life. It, it really does. It, 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 it did. So, and, and sometimes, no, so, there was sometimes the one eight will surprise y'all. <laughs> no, I mean, 
you know, as I got older, I understand even when they used to put, even though I was in the smarts class, they would put me in a seat by myself, like away from the other students because I talked too much in class. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, I realized the reason I talked so much because the work wasn't challenging of me. So I would finish the work and, you know, oh, I was looking for okay. other students. So exactly. Yeah. I was looking for other stuff to do. And, you know, they, and again, even in that class, there were so many bright kids that just their potential was unrealized because of the way we were taught and what we worked toward. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of our teachers in primary school were Jewish women. Now, that's not to say that they didn't have an interest in teaching us, but, you know, they're, they weren't from the community. Um, all of the students were black. All of the students grew up in the projects and there just wasn't a way for them to relate to us. Mm -hmm. And they and probably very little incentive for them to understand what would have helped us grow and develop and achieve in that environment. Because that environment was it was gang infested, it was drug, it was drugs, it was dilapidated housing. You know, this is on the heels of the sixties when many black communities were just destroyed. Mm. And all of the so we had to deal with the crack era after that. After you know, so by the time the crack era came around, I was on my way out. You know, I, I went off to college, and you know, so you know, I, I was in primary school in the '60s, mm -hmm. and you know, just going through that in in the '70s, went off to college, and actually, I started college in 1980. You know, so it was getting worse and worse and worse. So the last place I wanted to go back was home. Um, and so I'm, you know, it, and so yeah, all, every, you know, it's like a brain drain, an economy drain, a drain, you know, so anybody that could have helped the community really just left. And so what was left behind were, you know, the people who were struggling. And, and again, that's played out in, in so many communities all across the country, in, in right. DC and, and um, Chicago, and, you know, you just, Detroit, you just name it, it's, it's the same thing over and over again. Wherever, there was a, a riot on the heels of right after King was uh, assassinated. You, you'll, you're probably looking at a community that uh, was robbed of this, of this brain drain and people going to the suburbs, you know, the recently integrated suburbs and thinking they made it. But actually, I ended up moving back to home. And um, I where'd, you, where'd you go to school? Oh, I went to um, Syracuse University, upstate oh, Syracuse. New York. Okay. And, um, and I also went to a, a school that's now owned by New York University. Uh, I got a, a master's in engineering and an MBA from NYU, uh, starting school of business. So again, you know, and I was always in a technical discipline. And so I didn't take uh, literature courses. I, you know, so that's part of the reason. But certainly in, 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 the, in high school and early, I should have learned more about these writers oh, uh, yes. from the period. And so when I got out of college, in fact, you know, I just worked for different corporations. I worked for uh, Pratt and Whitney and United Technology, which is part of United Technologies. I worked for General Electric, uh, working on the GPS systems. And um, so I was really just focused on the corporate world, but there was always something that I really wanted to do something for myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the things I learned about going to college is, you know, you really are taught to work for someone else. You're not really taught to work for yourself. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. you're, you're trained to really be an effective corporate tool. You know? and, um, so, but I always there was always a part of me that I wanted to do something for myself. And um, uh, when I was in business school, I uh, taught people how to um, how to use computers. So computers were these new things back then, and um, there were programs like WordPerfect and Lotus One Two Three. <laughs> wow! So, I remember WordPerfect. You're really dating yourself. No, I, so no. I, remember, I use WordPerfect. <laughs> so no, these things were just really being invented. Right. And um, that's back in with Atari. <laughs> right. So when we was in B school, you were just expected to know that, but mm -hmm. no one knew it because these things just came out. So I worked in a computer lab and it was my job was to teach people how to use these programs when I was just learning how to use them myself. And so computers at the time were very expensive. So I decided to sell computers to people and help them use them. And I 
created a website, you know, about as early as it was possible to create a website. I created a website to promote my PC business. And I decided, well, you know what? It's much easier to build websites with people. I'll build websites with people than to get selling computers. And um, there was a client of mine who did these things called hand press flowers. You can actually find the website on um, the Internet Archive. I looked at it actually the other day. Um, so it was a, she sold hand pressed flowers or press flowers. And you know, when you press flowers, they last forever. So she made these picture frames and things with them. Mm -hmm. um, and it was nice. And so she was selling them. And uh, she was she didn't, couldn't sell, she didn't sell a single thing. And and she uh, just came to me and, and I was charging a monthly fee for keeping the website up. And I decided, well, she couldn't pay for it anymore. I said, well, let me try to figure out how to make money on the web, you know, e-commerce. So I could build websites, but I need to really understand more about selling things on the web. Mm -hmm. And that was in 97. So I sat down and in fact, I knew someone that had, that was selling, that had a website selling books. And so I, you know, I was aware of the site and I was like, this is not going to be doing well for them. So I said, you know, I asked them if they wanted me to just redo their site at no charge. And they said, no. I said, I, what? You, you need a site. You clearly need a better site. <laughs> so I just said, well, you know what? I'll build a website. And at the time, Barnes & Noble had a uh, uh, an affiliate program where you send people, a bar you have the books on your site, you send them to Barnes & Noble, and you get a percentage. Right, right. So I started out doing that. And as soon as I started doing that, I just discovered the world of books. It was like a whole new universe opened up to me because I was discovering authors and ideas, the people on the people on that post that you have over there, and you know some of the books that you have from Black Classic Press. I discovered who Black Classic Press was an example. Like I had no clue there were all of these books and people that I discovered the legacy of uh, the bookstores in Harlem. You know, there were no bookstores in Harlem when I was coming up. Now there was one Liberation Bookstore. Uh, but I didn't discover that until after I started this website. And I went back and I met uh, the woman, um, her name escapes me right now, um, Una Milzak, I want to say. But at any rate, she was very elderly, uh, but she was an important and iconic figure in Harlem. She provided books to you know activists. You know, she was part of the Black Arts Movement, and so the you know just discovering that. Um, you know, I'm just amazed. Now, where, where is the Liberation Bookstore now? It, like, it closed years ago. So, no, okay. So, what bookstores are in Harlem now? Um, there are, sad to say, no bookstores. There are no independent black owned bookstores in Harlem. Um, there that, are. That makes me drink right now. <laughs> <laughs> there, you know, mm. it's, it's, it's alarming. It's alarming. Part of, part of, there's a variety of reasons for that, and I won't suggest that I understand all of Well, them. we know it's going through gentrification. We know that, but still. Well, I mean, you know, there was a period as part and part of that gentrification, there was a, a bookstore that opened called Human Books. Oh, yeah, we go. Yeah, the sister mm -hmm. from uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, opened up a, uh, a new Human Bookstore in Harlem. Uh, but that store closed, um, I don't know, a decade ago? It closed yeah. some time ago. And, and that, at its time, it was the only black old bookstore. So the Schomburg Library has a nice little bookstore. Uh, the Studio Museum in Harlem has a nice little bookstore. Uh, but the titles are limited, and you're not going to get the kind of bookstores, books that you would have had in the Liberation uh, right. Right store. The, um, or the, like the books that you have here. You know, you have, you know, these are community, community resources. You, you, you have local authors books um you have and the master our, our teachers. books and the master teachers mm -hmm. and then you have the, you know the mainstream um contemporary you know, art yeah, you, you have it all but you also have conscious t-shirts that african uh you know wear and photographs i mean i i'm looking at the store now but you know you, you have it all and um i think that's important for a community to have and for Harlem not to have one is, you know, it's, it's yeah, gentrification is, is part of it. Yeah. Expensive real estate is 
part of it. Um, it's, it's a variety of reasons. Uh, but also part of it is, you know, I was part of the issue in the sense that I was educating the community and had, you know, just the, I, I didn't have um, a thirst for the material. I didn't know it existed. And it was, it was like you you just found, um, particularly African American literature, I don't want to say by accident, but it was literally was kind of by accident as you was trying to figure out this website, website of e-commerce and yeah, yeah. Yeah. How to make money on the internet, and you know that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, you know, in fact, the, I spend a lot of time working on the website, so it, you know, that's far more time. I, I basically well, have to... I, I will say, African American Literature Book Club website is the bottom.com. It is literally a place where you go to find everything literary, <laughs> right? Yeah. Put... I mean, you have done a wonderful job of just keeping track of. It's the African American literature culture. So. Yeah, in fact, you know, like I wore yeah. this shirt for a reason. This, and I love that shirt. Yeah, this book, this shirt uh, was produced by um, Wade Hudson of Just Us Books. Yeah, so the just, Hudsons love yeah. them. So mm -hmm. if you're not, so I discovered them. Yeah. So they they, they had a book, Just Us Books, that I was actually familiar with. Um, it was an ABC. It was a children's book. For mm -hmm. The, Af the Af Af Afro Afrobets. Afro right. Yeah. So I, I had actually seen that in the community. And, but you know, it's the only one I was aware of. I'm not even sure I discovered that book. But I thought it was it was interesting because it had black kids on it. And I just wasn't, um, just wasn't used to seeing black kids in books. So, so, so when you when you got introduced or when you was made aware of all, of basically African-American literature, so that's when you started to just focus in on African-American literature. Yeah, yeah, it became my mission in life. So, you know, I started the site in 97. I registered the domain in 98. Um, it became my livelihood in 08. And, I, you know, this this will be what I do until I'm, I'm done. My, my <laughs> ultimate goal, I mean, really, it's just this this is what I, you know, people so say. So now you have this passion. And yeah, yeah. People are like, you know, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. You know, that's true. I mean, I. I can work, I can work seven days a week, some days sixteen hours a day, and as I'm getting older, I got to get up a bit more and walk around, you know, I, you know. But I, you know, sixteen hours goes like that. It really does. It just the time literally just flies because you know people talk about getting into a flow, and yeah, it's a it's a thing. Now, as, as you, because you've been in the industry for over. Over twenty five years. Yeah. So, um, kind of, kind of share with us what, what what have you seen? Like, I know there you, you was a part of when a lot of bookstores was closed when you during during that the time. Pandemic. Yeah. Um, not before the pandemic. We were two thousand eight. We oh, actually yeah, opened because yeah. we had we had black. Um, images we had the black about. worm, black oh. bookworm in Fort Worth. We had black images in Dallas, and bookstores was closing because the the country was going through. Yeah, the, uh, we had a little depression in 2008, yeah, the, the, the housing market, crisis yeah. and all that going on. And, and it also, it was the increase of Amazon okay. and digital, and we had to deal with audio books, and we had to deal with all that. And so a lot of bookstores, especially our older elders, they wasn't going to deal, yeah, was, deal with all that. Right. And unfortunately, um, you know, the second generation didn't take over, and so they closed because they weren't going right, to right. deal with internet and all that stuff. Yeah, so, uh, we have we have very, one of the things, I call this the black, now Wade and I did this shirt independently, but I call this the black book ecosystem. And we um, we are facing some very profound challenges. You know, so yeah, the, the web, the emergence of the web made it possible for me to create the African American Literature Book Club. Right, because you, you strived on the, on the internet by a lot of well, here's the thing. So, you know, I got I, there was some pushback from from booksellers, you know. And, well, uh, yeah, that's what I did, especially the older ones, because I already know. I mean, I've talked to some of them before. They're like, eh, we, we're we're getting out of this because this is changing. The landscape is changing. People are on their computers and yeah, you know, but, all that. So but people also also pick up physical books, right? And, and that's what we that's what we've learned. Yeah, I mean, no, it's a you gotta do both book. though. We have we do audio as well on our website. Yeah, you have to do it all. I you mean, have to do it all. You really do. So you know, like when I was saying, I I got pushback from 
and the other black owned indie booksellers, you know, they, they felt as if AOBC was a threat. But I, you know, I was trying to explain to them, there are many communities that don't have bookstores. This is not a situation where I'm trying to take from you and you, you know, it's not a zero sum game, meaning that I don't achieve at your expense. You know, we, you know, we, we grow, together. grow together. We really can grow together if we support each other. So that was initially, you know, books. Are, so when I said, listen, there are places, most cities in the country don't have books, black owned bookstores. There are people like me in Harlem, New York, who aren't familiar with these types of books that aren't being reached. And I can help, I can help offset that. But, you know, I, I get people who come to me all the time say, yeah, I saw this book on your website. Nine times out of 10, they said, and I went to Amazon and bought it. But sometimes they'll go to a local bookstore and buy the book if they don't buy it from me. Okay. So, but again. But, but, but it's still supporting you, though, even though. Yeah. So okay. Because at that time you were. If nobody visits my site, I would be dead. Right? So I need the traffic. I need people to come to the site because the site is also a platform for people to promote their books. And so they so, can promote books, they can buy books, they can, they can see books. what's happening in the literary world. Yeah, I have um, you got festivals. Yeah, there's a list of, um, I guess, it's over 150 book festivals and fairs uh, throughout the country, and not just black uh, run book festivals and fairs, but there is a resource to authors if they want to, you know, visit a city, they can see what's happening, you know, during that time, or they they can schedule a tour, and even if they don't then that an event they can go and learn more about right. it. Mm -hmm. um, I have a list of uh, black owned bookstores now, and that list that list is strictly black owned independent bookstores. And you know, we people, appreciate that. Thank yeah, you. People wonder, well, why would you promote your competition? I'm like, it's not my competition. It's, it's my support. In an ideal world, you are you and the doc bookshop have been super supportive. We can do things collaboratively collaboratively and we could help each other. Mm -hmm. But that's not um, typical. I mean, it's not, yeah, that's the, more the exception than the rule. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, it's more the exception than the rule. So I won't, you know, like, but I can, I won't. And truth of the matter is, I, I, don't, I don't even believe in, in black bookstore competition. Like we, we can't compete against each other. We have to support one another. We have to, Share. I mean, it really is enough for everybody, to be honest. Yeah. And I don't think we're, you know, there's kind of like in Dallas Fort Worth. I mean, we have Pan African connection in Dallas. Who you work with? Yeah, definitely. And as and, and we're in Fort Worth, and you know, and we share. If we don't have it, we tell them go to Pan. In fact, we send a lot of people to Pan African. Sure. <laughs> to, you know, you go to Dallas. But, but I'm just saying, um, you know, I don't that competition thing. It's just we we can't afford to really be. No, we, that's, we that, have to work together. And that's the I right mean, word, afford. Because, right. you know, how they say if you work together or you could die alone. Right, you know, right. It, so, yeah, we have to definitely. Um, yeah, so which actually makes me think about this book. Because uh, now you're publishing. Yeah, I am publishing. Wow, I started okay. publishing books. And um, it's, um, again. So do you ever see yourself writing a book? Yeah, potentially. So I've written a, a lot over the years. You've written forwards and stuff I'm yeah going, like introduction to this book and, right and but do you like see that. like you writing a book it would be fiction. it would be something related to the web something tech related. Oh, okay we're not not, not, fiction. not a novel okay. i mean i have ideas for that too but no that's you know i haven't studied the craft enough to even think about writing a book <laughs> okay. writing a, writing a good book is exceedingly difficult it's not it's not, not as easy as everyone thinks no it's not i it's mean not. if people can crank them out but to write a, I don't know. I mean, you got to be really imaginative to write. A, yeah. I, I admire writers. I actually love authors because I'm like, all that was going on in your head? Like, yeah. and <laughs> like it, that is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm like, you're more technical. I'm not really yeah, yeah. Uh, creative. But you need so. all types in order to make what they say black books go. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when the I. The ecosystem as you yeah, when I yeah when I published this book, uh, Running to Fall by Kalisha Buchanan, and I, and I love this cover. I and and the author cover. actually created this cover, so she. You told me that I was amazed. Yeah, she. Uh, so she 
Now, Kalisha's, um, Kalisha rather, is an accomplished and acclaimed author. She could have published this book with any a major house or, or major independent, as she has in the past. But uh, she actually chose to allow me to publish this book. Wonderful. And so in turn, what I've done is this book was physically printed by a, a Black-owned printing press called Black Classic Press. Um, yeah. Shout so out I, to Baba Paul Coates. Paul Coates. Mm -hmm. um, this, in fact, fun fact, Paul Coates is ta Coates' father. Yes. For those who don't know. For mm -hmm. those who don't know. Uh, but he has a, like, you know, his former Black Panther. He has a legacy of oh, yeah. within the community. And so I was like, you know, got, I printed this book with him. Uh, the internal designer of the book is a sister out of, actually, she's out of Dallas. Um, Natalie Stokes Peters. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know Natalie. She's, I don't know Natalie. But she's. I want to say she also might be, from Dallas. She's definitely from Texas. Okay. Uh, she might be Dallas. And um, okay. you know the. Uh, That's a beautiful cover. Though. Yeah, I love that cover. Yeah. So uh, it's, you know, so everybody. I would recommend this book for our book club. Please do. I am. Yeah. Running to fall. So I would recommend. Yeah. This so for our literary. Life. It's literary fiction. It talks to you know the, a black female protagonist. She has a problem. You know she grew up impoverished, but she grew up and married well, and she's doing well for herself. And they're strivers. They move to a, a Tony uh, community, um, and they they have to maintain appearances, but she's struggling to do that for some reasons, and uh, eventually it comes to a head. Okay. And uh, so she just describes this lady's journey in, in the book. And her name is, woman's name is Tragedy. And so Tragedy uh, has some things to deal with. She named her Tragedy? The, the character's name is Tragedy, yeah. Who, okay, who would name their child? <laughs> tragedy. Could, but anyway. Yeah. Find out, yeah. yeah, that's tragic. Yeah. So, okay. now this is. Good. It's a good story, I think. Okay. Diane, I know you had a note for me. You probably just need to tell me because I can't see. You don't have my glasses on. If you have comments or questions, they can put it in your chat. And thank you for listening. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, definitely. If you have comments or questions, even even this, our studio, let us know. <laughs> just just give us a hand raise if you want to chime in because I can talk to Troy. Like, we can have conversation all day. So definitely uh, let us know if you have any comments or questions. Please subscribe. We are... Um, we're, we're, we have a special guest here today for those who are just tuning in, um, Troy Johnson, he's the president of African American Literature Book Club. He's doing great work in the literary world and he published two books now. He's a publisher, you know, and he, um, the voices of the Harlem Renaissance. And now this is, All right, so you wrote the, you wrote I, the introduction yeah, on this book. I just wrote it. I didn't publish this book. This is published by, uh, um, a small, uh, small right. independent press. Yes, yes, um, yes. And I wrote the intro to this, and, and this title I published. Right. And I have a, t a book coming out in a couple of weeks. It's a middle grade book called Jamani's Key. And That's right. it, it deals with, are you familiar with Anthony Browder and the work that he's been doing in Egypt? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I, I always want to go on one of his trips. I, <laughs> I, I actually, I'm helping to that, organize that, that, a, a group to go. Are you really? Yeah, so. Um, where y'all going? I might want to go with y'all. Uh, that's been on my bucket list for like I will, I will the last information 15 years. Here. In fact, I'm meeting with Tony uh, at the end of the month, like next week. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, so he's coming down to Tampa. Um, that's where you are now? I'm in Tampa, Florida now, yeah. Okay, so last time we talked, you were in Oklahoma. I was in Oklahoma then, working on Black Wall Street. So. <laughs> you know, I try to, it's just been a great experience that working in uh, Oklahoma was really nice. So, it's tragic. I mean, it's one of these stories. Uh, I understand it was similar here. It was the same in St. Petersburg, Florida, and uh, all, all throughout oh, the country. Oh, yeah, all throughout the country where they destroyed black communities. Yeah, with, with freeways. You know, just mm -hmm. so Black Wall Street um, was burned down, you know, and, and was destroyed uh, by a white racist mob who yeah. didn't, you know, you know, the pretense for that was garbage, was, you know, just so they destroyed it, they rebuilt it. I mean, I, I don't think a lot of people appreciate that uh, Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma was rebuilt. And then they came through and ran a freeway through it and just, that was a death knell. So when you look at, um, when you look at 
what's left, you know, it's, a sh it's, it's been gentrified. You know, they put uh, OSU campus on it. it. It's just, it's been overrun. So it, it effectively, the you know, Black Wall Street, is, Black Wall Street is kind of like a spirit. It's a, it's a, uh, yeah, I think they have a museum there, right? There's a, a very nice museum. Um, there are a handful of stores that are left. Um, and that's about it, really. Yeah, so, we went up and there as a cultural for center. the 100th. Oh, uh, were you there? I missed you. Mm -hmm. I was there. Yeah, I was there. I, I was, okay. Because there was a lot of people. Because, uh, yeah, Ramonda uh, from uh, Mahogany Books, she's from there. So, she, yeah, I saw her there. Really? I didn't yeah. see either one of you all. <laughs> Oh, Troy, but we couldn't get it. Oh, yeah, Troy we're got busy. To, get out of here. Yeah, we were trying to get I'm in touch with you. Yeah. But yeah, we were um, yeah, we went down there. Did you see the concert with uh, who was performing that night? Uh, oh, PJ. I went to go, I was there for PJ Morton. Okay. I love PJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was cool. All right. It was cool. But so you you know what's there. I mean, so you saw the streets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you said, it's it's it's, it's you know. It, unfortunately, I, I believe that we can't get to that glory, but it just be in a different way. Um, it's not gonna be. It probably did mention Fulton Books because she's right there in the area and she's trying to do some great things right now. Yeah, yeah I understand. Uh, they're moving onto uh, Archer or Pine Street. I mean, not Pine. Uh, Archer Greenwood. They're moving to, onto Greenwood Street. So where the museum is, uh -huh. I understand they're relocating somewhere on that street. Okay. And then that's they, good. And then like Mahogany Books, mm -hmm. I believe they're opening up a, a branch on in the airport. So at Tulsa International, they were not. Oh, they in that airport? I thought Mahogany was in no. DC. So um, the bookstore out of Tulsa is going to be. You know, oh, Fulton is going to be also. Oh, okay. That's oh. my understanding. Oh, and, well, that's um, awesome. And Mahogany Books is opening a third location at Reagan. In wow. The airport. So they have mm -hmm. the one in, um, in Oxon Hill by the, the harbor. Uh -huh. They have one in Southeast. Um, there's what, Anacostia. Anacosta. Yeah. And uh, they have um, and the airport coming up. So, well, sh shout out to Mahogany Books. They're doing a great yeah. She was here. Yeah, a couple we, weeks ago. We love, we love Ramonda and um, her husband. Derek. Derek, yes, yes. And Ramonda went to when it came. Ramonda came in two weeks ago. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they, you know, so yeah, I know them from, from the start. You know, they also, they worked for a, probably the largest black owned book chain when they first, when they first got into the business. They worked for, um, we know him. We know we him. Had a, we had Brother a Yao and yeah. Um, yeah, he was in St. Louis. He was in the he was more so in the Midwest. And um, don't make me go around and call Reminder. <laughs> we just I want to know I'm the name. We this had thing. a black bookstore. Yeah, they had like six, six. Uh, yeah, six he actually days. he actually contacted us when he oh, early what's on. What's the name of the store? Yeah, you know, yeah. we know it. Nubian, no. Nubian, no, not Nubian Heritage. Uh, Nubian Heritage is. I'm gonna have to go call Ramonda real quick. This is gonna make me crazy. I'm calling. Call her Google because I want a name. Oh. Before oh. I, today. <laughs> I got. If you didn't know, okay. Like well, anyway, they um, the, those the two brothers that ran that um, store. They had they. I don't know another bookstore chain that was as large, and they were a Carol. pure. Karibu. Karibu. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So I do remember Karibu. Yeah, they, they yeah all, okay. They were all over. Yeah. Uh, but no, you know, and they were a terrific, they were a world class uh, bookstore. Oh, yeah. So you go in there and it was as good as any other bookstore in the country. Yeah. Um, you know, but then we have a lot of iconic stores that are still open. I like, you know, Marcus Books in uh, Oakland. Mm -hmm. We went you to know. that one. Oh, so <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, you know, so they're, uh, I was finding things in that book that I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are. And that's how I felt when I went to everyone's place. I okay. mean, in Baltimore, Baltimore. like yeah. they have, I was finding stuff that I ain't seen. Like, yeah. I'm like, wow. So, yeah. And they have stores. quite a collection. So they got, yeah, there's store, they some terrific stores all over the country. I mean, mm -hmm. but it's just not a lot. Yeah. You know, it's not a lot, and um, we, we need more. How many do we have now? My list has, I think, 153. Okay. 
but you know, I'm counting, you know, a wide range of, of stores. So stores like this one, numbers well under hundred. I mean, I, I tend to go through the list and really kind of like really segment the stores. So I have some pop-up stores, like my pop-up and what I do. I'm gonna say there's several pop-ups. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I, I, I include the pop-ups. Uh -huh. You know, I, I, um, you know, I include my presence. Like, you know, I have an office out of in Tampa. You can come by and buy a book, but it's not a retail store. Nothing like this. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, that, that, that a range like that. So if we really push it, we can get you know maybe 150. My list has 153, but a store like this, brick and mortar, brick and mortar. You know, not doing. You know, like you don't have a cafe in here. That's not your. You know, your main We're thing trying. is. Right. Oh, so but if the cafe Try. is the primary business and you just happen to have books, you know, so I'm, I'm counting stores like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's because they're all important. They all provide some type of uh, mm -hmm. uh, resource to the community. And uh, but in terms of a store like this, it's not a lot. And, and, I, and again, I would say, particularly with this footprint, um, less than 50. But again, someone, you know, like that's one of the things that I like to do is with my platform is provide that type of resource. Mm -hmm. You know, Great work. Where, 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 who is, what is the biggest black owned bookstore in the country? There are plenty of people who say they are, but, you know, we should be able to quantify that. Um, what is, how many black books were published in a given year? We should, yeah, we should know. with that. our metrics. You're right. We <laughs> need some. We really should know. <laughs> I mean, we need someone to keep up with our metrics. That's the problem. You know, we don't keep up with our metrics, but other folks are. <laughs> well, actually, no. I mean, there is no, if you want to get into the weeds, you know, there are these things called BISAC codes. There's a couple of things that say African American, but that's not an exhaustive list of black books. And you can have applied uh, African American code to a book that might have been written by a white person or someone who's not black. And, um, but I have there are indications that 2022 was the a year where fewer black books were published than in the last 10 years. I can't. 2022? 2022. Really? Now, this is. I would. Okay. And I, I'll tell you why. So there are. Is it after the pandemic or something? This, I, mean, I don't know if your experience comports with this, but I, you know, I have a database of books. And when I looked at the numbers, 2022 was the lowest year um, in 10 years. And I'm constantly adding books to the database. Now, I don't have an exhaustive list of every book ever published. I'm not trying to count any published books. I'm talking about books published by the big, uh, what is it, five now, um, mm -hmm. publishing houses, and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the major independents, you know, like a Kensington, a uh, Lee and Lowe, and, and a Akashic. But um, so these big independents and the big major publishers, when I look at my database, you, in the most recent year has fewer books in it, that's gotta be indicative of something. But again, well, what, what do you know. think, what do you think? I think they're just fewer are, books. Now, are you, are, you, are you adding in, there it was a high influx of books written by Africans that were prominent amongst the big five. All right, so here's the thing that-, that Oh, no, that's a thought. Yeah, now, we, now when you say African-American- I include- I, African Okay. Thought. Yeah, I include books written by black people, whether they're from Africa or the diaspora. Okay. The, but the thing that might obscure this is in recent years, so the last five years, there have been more black books winning things like um, the National Book Awards. There was one year in that range where Four of the three of the four big books were, you know, uh, oh. awarded to black writers. You know, people like Jasmine Ward is one too. Um, you know, so there've been a lot of black books in a lot, a great deal of notoriety. You know, obviously after George uh, George uh, Floyd was murdered, yeah. there was a great deal of publicity. That was such a unicorn year. I mean, did you guys make a ton of money? <laughs> <laughs> we got we got a ton of well, you know. You can't remind me again. That's <laughs> you, you made it, and you, and you, you know, your your bills was up too. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to pay these publishers and all. So yeah, it was a lot. There was a lot of activity. It yeah, was. No, um, it was. So but that was so. Audience, let me just explain. Yeah. After George Floyd, 
was was assassinated. He was just murdered, murdered on, TV. on TV. On television. Yeah, just almost. It messed up America. Okay, and you had, I'm telling you, Caucasians. Uh, it was Asians. We had Middle Easterns. We had an influx of Native Americans. We had all types of people coming to the bookstore and was wanting to support the bookstore. But, and it's just across all businesses. It was just, it was, a, we call it the unicorn year because it was just so abnormal. I mean, we appreciate it was beautiful. Yeah. But we had to but, really get down who really, I don't know what, who kicked it off in your sphere, but from our perspective, but then, wait, wait, it wait, was let me a my story, though, But mm -hmm. now everything is back to normal. Let me just say that. Okay. <laughs> we, so it it was fun while it lasted, though. When it got kicked off the influx, when people say, if you want to really understand the African-American story and the African-American experience from us, Martha Stewart put it on her page and they interviewed bookstores. And to me, that's when the Oprah's and oh, all yeah. Martha Stewart, Mark's advertised for, bookstores, Oprah, everybody was advertising the bookstores. But, you had, yeah, you but, it came, but it came off of that energy. Like she didn't, it wasn't somebody who you would suspect to put the energy out there. It was a Martha Stewart that Put it on her page. Yeah, invariably, you know. Yeah, if you want to learn more about, you know, African American, read a book. Go to a black. No, go to an African American bookstore or a black owned bookstore. Yeah, no, that 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 was phenomenal. You know. Yeah. I was sitting in my office. And know, it was a shock for us. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at. I see an order for Ibrahim Kendi's book, uh, "How to Be an Anti-Racist," coming. Uh huh. And so I was like, okay, if the you know. There are certain books that if I get an order from, you know, more than a handful. So more than a handful came in. I was like, let me go check Amazon. Amazon didn't have it. So I was like, okay, that explains why they're coming to me. They're doing a Google search. Amazon's not shipping it. I have inventory and Ingram had it in stock. So I was able to ship the books. And, you know, I got a hundred orders in like, you know, a day or two. Which is it, it was it was crazy, and it wasn't, and they were coming from everywhere, like Wisconsin. Yeah. And, it was like, you know, like it was like as if the universe was saying, "Don't y'all dare close," because we were we were shuddering, <laughs> <laughs> like we were. No, you don't understand. No, I don't we were like, that. okay, so how do we go ahead and? It was for this. us. It was the at, at before that. Uh, and started, it was, was the like, nation oh, no. of Islam that said, you know, we're going to continue to support this store through this pandemic. That was, a, you know, our really? mosque number 52. Yeah, they, they were kept on coming into the store. They encouraged their members. Oh, yeah, shout out to mosque. Mosque number, number 52. 52. They, they, they Before that they happened. Still, they still, the nation. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 But, um, but um, we had a, we, we, come, we had an uh, online call with Black-owned independent bookstores. Right at the start of the Wait pandemic. Wait a minute. We're, okay. Are we over? We are. <laughs> I told you we could talk forever. We have, we're going to do a part two. We okay. are. Because I still want to get your commentary on book bands. Y'all, Troy has to get to the airport. Okay, because I can drive. We got to do the book bands. We got oh, we got so much ground we have to cover yeah. with you, Troy. And, and, yeah. and I still want to talk about Tula Summer. He was here for the Tula Summer Book Fair, everyone, that happened on yesterday at the African American Museum. It was a wonderful, beautiful event. Shout out to Dr. Robinson and Helen and, and all those um, who who just you know made that event a success. It was wonderful. It yeah. was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Patrick so, Oliver did Patrick his thing. Patrick Oliver did his Oliver. thing. Yeah, and you were part of this panel called when was your panel? Winning at publishing, and we have an author in the audience. Uh, Courtney, what's your, what's your last? Oh, oh, I all three of them are authors. Brent Tom was in the back. Yeah, they, we had um, it was a it was a great event, and, and you know there's some you know um, what's the sister's name? Uh, President of Smith College, what ex President of Smith College. The finance the lady. Who is the check? Dr. Melvo. Yeah, Julianne Melvo. Oh, can you hear? Oh. <laughs> 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 Do you have to see? 
I, 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 I didn't know you were talking about Julian. I would have. I'm having to sing. 365 yeah, days in Black History. Okay, that's her yeah. But she, she actually today. told me about. You know? She told a, a really interesting story she's about great. the Tulsa race massacre at that event. I thought, oh, she's yeah, she's, she's a genius. Yeah, she's a member yeah. of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. Actually, incorporated. Yep. All right. Delta's in the house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, like, no, yeah, we could talk about it. Yeah, we can, we can. And and Troy has to go. So, Danya, um, is there any questions in the comments or anything that we need to address as we close out? We're gonna do a part two, Troy, because I'm seriously I want to talk about oh my god betting that's going on. Okay. We need a commentary on that. And um, yeah, and some other but, stuff. Uh, yeah, if we could link to that uh, that uh, call that we had, where bookstores were actually saying, you know, you know, this is a march. And they was like, yeah, we're going to close. We're not going to make it. That's one was out of oh, LA. Oh, you don't understand. It was, it was, I'm telling everyone, I, I believe the ancestors did that. And, all, uh, all them hanging up there and more. Oh, yeah. yeah they did that funny. thing. Because we were shuddering. We were like, okay. <laughs> and a few weeks later. Diane, how much room do you have in your garage? That's what we're doing. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, no, we're not going to the garage. And so they made this way. And it was. Awesome, and it was a shocker. We call it the unicorn year. Ramonda, <laughs> Ramonda call it the unicorn year. He said, don't, that's not normal. Do not get comfortable with that. Well, see, well, I mean, we could talk about that as well. I, I believe some some businesses may have looked at that as if this was part of the cost, who didn't have a history of understanding that it's not, and may have jump in and think and, and think if this is the normal and then realize yeah. okay okay yeah we got okay wait no what role do you see african-american bookstores i mean african-american authors in help supporting bookstores especially when they have uh come from an african-american narrative or perspective like you know like your carrie washington she has her book coming out and oh. she's telling her her story but in her experience, and they're producing some great books. Do you think that they can be an enlightenment or help in this, you know, somewhat of a hard time? You mean celebrity authors? Yeah. What well, Yeah. That's oh, what I'm yeah, interpreting. Of course. Shout out to um, Jeezy. We we appreciate Jeezy when he came to our bookstore. I mean, when celebrities come, you know, we we love local authors. We love national bestselling authors, but. We all know celebrities, you know, they, they got a larger platform, so they're going to have a larger uh, signing and support. And so, and that really helps the bookstore. So we were, we were, I have a whole new yeah, no, love for Gen Z. Okay. I, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know anything about, no, I'm just kidding. No, I, I knew that one song. I didn't know it was him actually. I but your, it, your, I all your, for my city. But now all your I nephews am, knew who he was, and then right, all, all my nephews knew. But I, now, but now I know him. You know sure. what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah, yes. we appreciate it, and I but appreciate that, him. But yeah, I yes. think that uh, one thing that authors, celebrity or otherwise, should do is find a couple of bookstores that they want to support, and instead of saying, you know, I can't tell you how many people I've interviewed, and they're holding their book. And, I, and there's, you know, and I'm interviewing them. I'm creating a video of them and I'm putting, I'm helping to promote them. And, and then shout out to Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> and then shout out to Amazon. Wait, we, oh. actually, we actually help Arthur's. I tell Arthur's, just say where books are sold. Wherever quality just, books are sold. Whenever yeah. you shout out your books, just say wherever books are sold. And then that will cover everybody. Right, you don't have and to worry not, about alienating yeah. you. Yeah. And know, yeah. It, it's like, uh, and well, I, don't, I don't think Arthur's really understand the dynamics, dynamics between Indies and Amazon. Like, Amazon or Barnes and Noble. They'll send us a link. Oh, my book is on Amazon. My book is on Barnes and Noble. Not knowing that your book is on the doc website. Mm -hmm. it, it would be a good idea to say, I found my book on your website. What can I do to get it promoted amongst all of these books? And I sometimes I go and send them where your book is here too, you know, and right. let them know. Yeah, I, yeah I, I just say I just tell Arthur the language. You know, when you're promoting your book, just say where, and even celebrities are saying it, where where books, where everywhere where books are sold. Yeah, but you know what? You can't you can't go wrong with that. Yeah, I, but again, I I think still you can say that, and but instead of saying Amazon, pick a store too. I mean, your local that would be store, nice. Definitely so a local bookstore. Fort Worth, say, Bookshop. 
you know, or if you want to support ALBC, say the African American Literature Book Club. There's a link. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just because people who want to buy from Amazon will buy from Amazon. Right. You know, they don't need they don't need our promotion. <laughs> you know, they really don't. I think Amazon is doing okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do okay. You know, so. Yeah. Okay. So okay, they put their own bookstore out of business. Yeah, they try to do brick and mortar and Amazon. Like you know what? We just want to. Yeah, brick and mortar is a whole. Other, it takes a yeah. whole other level. Why of pay the electric bill? We don't have to. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, nah, they have brick. Well, they still have stores with no people in them, right? They shut them. They shut all their stores. They don't. Yeah, they don't have. I'm about like just chips and stuff. Like there was one. I want to say this airport. What? Uh, I was in they airport have the warehouses. No, I'm talking about a, a store where they sell like chips and soda. You walk in through a turnstile and you pick up the stuff and you walk out. They still have those stores around. There's one in, I want to say it was one at the Love. I'm in, I'm, I've been up too many airports recently. Day. <laughs> well, yeah, you were trying. Okay, everyone, you were working. Okay, so we're, we're, we got to close up because you got to go catch your plane. We're going to continue our conversation at a later date. I'll get you back on count. Thank you, everyone. The studio audience, thank you so much for your presence on today. We appreciate you. Shout out. Real quick. Shout out. They can hear you. They probably can't see you, but go ahead and say oh, your come name. Up. Come in front of the camera. Well, can you? Well, okay. yeah, or they can stand right here. Yeah. Maybe. Okay, oh, Arthur. Couple. Yeah, come on. Arthur's, Arthur's <laughs> come, come real quick with, with your... We want, we want to give... At least... You got your book? Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Now, okay. she was a bestseller at Trinity. I don't know how she put Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> she she did her thing. She was the first one there. I think she was. Celeste, yes. Celeste saves the city. This book, you did. Yeah, you did. Okay, stand right here. Yeah. And just, and just um, real quick, just give your. Can I see your name? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey. hey. Now, real quick, give us your name and here's your book and and how can they reach you? Like, yeah. So this is my book, uh, Celeste the City. My name is Courtney Kelly, and my book is based on my life. It tells the story of a little girl who grows up in New Orleans but has to evacuate from Hurricane Katrina. So oh, wow. she becomes a civil engineer to save the city from flooding. And you can find my book everywhere books are sold. Yeah. <laughs> it's available. It's on the Yahoo's website. Yes, on the Yahoo's <laughs> website. Um, also, uh, you Courtney's planning. <laughs> you can follow me at Courtney Kelly Books. And maybe I'll be at your this year as well. We'll see. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Thank you. And your name of the year? And my name is Carla Nivens. My book is True Leaders with Heart. It's weekly meditations okay. for leaders. Oh, yeah. My book is also on uh -huh. your website. We just looked it up. Oh, so you know, both of us will say that all the time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we learned that just now. Oh, that's so, oh, yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. And look at more. Okay. True Leaders with Heart. Yes. So is, is the daily, is the month, is the year? Or is, what is yes. It goes for the whole year. And it's okay. weekly meditation for leaders. One of the things that I have found that, uh, you know, we're always giving to people, sharing with people. We're in front of people, doing all the talking, doing all the caring for. And who's caring for the leaders? Who's helping you to keep your cup? Feel. So Ooh, that's, that's what this I might even bring you to my church. Okay. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> Oh my gosh. She can sing and she has a book. So, oh, okay, yeah. St. John. Okay. <laughs> we might need to bring you not only to the bookstore, but to my church. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Yes. Make sure. Do we have your information? Are you connected with us? I, I will. Well, my book is on your website, number one. Yes. <laughs> so that's how we're connected. And we, yes, we'll get connected. Yes, definitely. Okay, well, thank, well, thank, you, thank you all. You. And Chuck, <laughs> now y'all, Chuck book comes out in spring 2024, but you want to talk about Yes, uh, come on. The Easter soup? Where's your, did I get his card? He's got one winning, don't you? You don't have his card. Okay, let me go. <laughs> Okay, Chuck. Okay, now Chuck, you gotta, you gotta add this to your. Yeah, he's got. I already talked to him. You already talked to him. Yes. Okay. Hi, Chuck. We love Chuck. We do. I'm, I'm trying to. Thing here too, right? I'm trying to talk to you to come here back. Just one. I mean, he used to do it every Tuesday. Okay, maybe I burned out, but maybe like once a year now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Y'all heard that? Okay. I got, I got you on tape. Okay. Okay, so Chuck, you got a book coming out. Tell us your title of your book. Yeah, I got it. I put it in. Okay, oh, wow. now, there it is. There it is, y'all. There you go. Spring 2024. The there actual is. release date is January 23rd, 2024. 
uh, Elijah's Easter suit. Elijah's uh, Easter suit. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a simple story about a young man on the quest to find the perfect Easter suit, but he discovers some some real key lessons. Uh, one of those lessons is that creativity often is a better pursuit than consumerism, right? Oh. It's to encourage you know young men to really kind of step out there and realize that you know the ability to create from the things around you oftentimes mm. is a lot better than to consume the things around you so but yeah awesome. that's to check that. okay we look yeah. forward to that we're gonna have so much fun with that book yeah, it's on that we are <laughs> we are because you know check, that's the only book written by african americans dealing with the topic of easter oh. so like he's yeah, you got his own little okay. genre. Yeah, and pre-order on ALBC. Pre-order on ALBC. <laughs> <laughs> it's up there. All righty. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in on Doc Live with our wonderful guest, Troy Johnson, thank our you, dear friend. And we'll have links to the books that were mentioned here. I wrote, yeah, we're definitely going to have links to his books and be on our website. And we, author's books. And hopefully, you know, we're going to talk to Kalisha and see if she could come to our uh, Literary Soul Fest. We'll talk about it. If not, maybe do a virtual something with her. But we'll yeah. definitely um, promote it during the Literary Soul Fest. So thank you all for tuning in. And y'all have a wonderful I'll have day. Yeah, authors, those authors that were just mentioned, I'll have those books on the link, too. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much. Read, love, and live. All right. So you'll, uh, you'll send me a link, too? Oh, sure. Are we all things?